Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden. Hope you're having a great week. Yeah, that reminds me that it's time to start recording the podcast. How nice. Thank you, Microsoft. Anyway, uh, it is spring. Yeah, in full bloom, literally in a lot of places. Uh, Have you seen some of those photos from that California super bloom? Well, we're just grateful to have snow-free ground, truly. Uh, What are you working on? We'll talk about that a little bit. We'll talk about your own travel and where your dog uh, fits into that. But mainly today, we're we're all about you gear geeks out there, and I got to admit, that's what I am. We're going to have two guys who are insiders in in the upland bird hunting world who uh who are affiliated with companies that you probably heard of first off heath signer of hunt ready the strap vest company kind of a startup uh love their products uh for a bunch of reasons we'll get into that he'll talk about the company and how it started what they're doing and why they're doing it and maybe we'll get a little tutorial as well and then russ jones will join us as well he's from browning apparel they've got a lot of news to report to us first so if you're interested in any of that kind of stuff and who isn't well stick around for the upland nation podcast We'll also talk about um, some thoughts on how a dog thinks. That's my Handle It segment this week. And like I said, we'll talk about where your dog rides after a long, hard hunt where they did most of the difficult work. It's all brought to you by Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Pointer Shotguns, Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School, True Lock Choke Tubes, MidwayUSA.com. Joy Dog Food and find birdhuntingspots.com. Well, you've heard the phrase you gotta crawl before you can walk and walk before you can run. Well, <laughs> It applies to humans as well. Right now, I'm I'm working on steadiness with Flick this uh, this summer. That that's going to be my goal is to is to master that, and we're already working on it, of course. Um, and I've told you about what we're trying to do right now is trying to get him steady when he can see the birds, and those birds are just kind of milling around instead of frozen. We want them to move a little bit, and they're doing that pretty well. Um, Still working on the dizzying, the pigeon thing a little bit better. But uh, anyway, that's all working. Now, the key is next, and you've been there. You can relate to this. It usually happens in a nav-to-hunt test for us. Um, The bird will not fly. At some point, you want them to fly, yes. And, uh, you know, not training, but in the real world. And so ultimately, you have to literally run at that bird to get him to get it get into the air. Well, I made the mistake of jumping right to that stage without uh, walking or sort of, you know, figuratively crawling toward the birds first. And yeah, it was the disaster you thought it would be. Uh, but we're back at it, and I am walking with alacrity toward birds, and they are flying as they should, and Flick is steady as he should be. And then the gun goes off, and everybody's happy, and he's still standing. So we're getting closer by the day. You probably too. You know, you break it into little steps, whatever you're working on, and uh, uh, hopefully you're making progress too. All right. So what else are you doing? Well, I asked on the Facebook page a while back, where does your dog ride at the end of a long hunt? And I showed a picture of um, uh, one of my older dogs. Uh, I think that was a buddy. He was just zonked out in the back seat of my crew cab pickup all by himself, just basically unconscious after a long, hard day. And uh, so I asked you, And Scott Stevens said it best, wherever she wants. Harry Hill says, the floor of the cab. Yeah, you know, Flick will do that once in a while, especially behind the driver's seat. He'll just curl up in that little well there. It's, you know, it's kind of a nice, nesty kind of a thing. Travis Hampton, among others, uh, in the kennel with the insulated cover, and he's wearing a coat. 
But when we get home or to the hotel, they get their lap time. Good for you. Feathered Tails and Wings says, One on the bench seat of my Ford Expedition. The other three are in kennels at the rear of my SUV. And, of course, they're all passed out. (laughs) Brad Fleming has got another great strategy. The oldest dog gets the cab. Everybody else is in the box. Uh, Roughland Kennel, good choice. Tina Lawrence, uh, let's see. Uh, Kennels again for Bob Jimenez. Uh, Kennels for uh, H. R-C-H-U-H, Wildfire Deacon. Hey, send me a PM and tell me what all that stands for, by the way. In their kennel, memory foam pads in the back of the SUV. And I'm doing that a lot more, by the way, especially if I need to keep Flick still, like when he had all those stitches. Put the put the crate in the back seat or put the back seat up and it fits perfectly right there. And that's what John Pavetta does. He says it fits real well in his Ram 2500. So, uh... I would imagine it'll work in mine as well. All right. Uh, Well, lots of great information there and some very clever responses too. So uh, um, safety first, uh, big, 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 big message there from a lot of people. Some great pictures too. Nicola Nioka Thomas, that's a new one on me. Good old short hairs in the back, sharing the seat, and then some Weimariners from Brian Reynolds. So, you know, a little bit of everything, a mixed bag on opinions there. I'm not judging because I'm the same way, depending on how I feel about the dog and how he did. uh, Maybe I should be grateful he can't judge my performance in the field, or I'd be riding in the bed of the pickup truck. We're brought to you by sageandbreaker.com. They have the gun cleaning and gun care gear that you need. Everything from a shotgun case to uh, clean, lube, and protect. That is a uh, spray-on fluid, if you will, non-toxic, and uh, and, uh, does some things that some of your perhaps more traditional products won't do. So take a look at all their products. Get ready for the return of the revolutionary and incredibly beautiful plus functional range bag. Sold out, coming back. Don't worry. Get on the mailing list at sageandbreaker.com so that you hear about it when it is available again. Sageandbreaker.com. And Trulock Jokes has a choke tube for just about any shooting activity and just about any gun, including all the sub gauges. Uh, no, I didn't count them all, but Scott Trulock assures me they have over 2,000 different shotgun choke tubes. And one of the things I found very lucky uh, when I get a new gun and I want to change out the shotgun choke tubes, first thing I do is go to the page at trulockchokes.com that gives me all the identification codes. You know those little notches on the front end of your choke tubes? Well, they're not always the same, depending on the manufacturer. You can get a clue to all of them right there. Consider TrueLockChokes.com your choke tube resource. Well, if you're like, I know you're like me. That's why you listen to the podcast. (laughs) I I cannot get enough gear. And it's not because I grew up poor and I didn't have any. It's because I just love this stuff and I love innovation. And so do you. That's why you're always looking for the next big thing when it comes to gear and equipment. Well, we've got a great show in store for you, starting with Russ Jones. He's the assistant product manager of apparel at Browning. Yeah, you know, all that Browning gear that you see with the buck uh, on it. Yeah, he's the guy who, who heads out a lot of that stuff. Russ, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. So am I. And I, and I enjoyed our brief discussion. We met at, at SHOT Show. Um, I was looking at uh, the, the vest that um, still holds the, the, the brand name Bird in Light. Um, 
seeing if seeing if the former owners of that trademark did any of the things I suggested they do when I consulted to them, and and they did. So good on you. <laughs> awesome. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. The, the, what, tell me more about you and Browning and and all of that. So I have been with Browning for about six years in a design and development capacity. I design and develop all of the apparel products here at Browning. And this year we've been able to give a lot of attention and focus to our Upland line um, to make it lighter, stronger, breathable. Um, and it's been really fun to work on that project. I also do help with the design of knives, lights, um, some accessories and camouflage patterns as well. And oh, cool. I, I really love being at Browning. Well, you know, that, I mean, that is a massive charge that you are faced with. And that is, I mean, how do you innovate in those worlds? I mean, wh how does that start? Well, me personally, I am a hunter through and through. I, I can't stand being inside. I like being outside pushing product to the limit and shooting. And so hunting for me is a way of life and being at Browning, knowing where the problems are, knowing how a hunt scenario is going to go down. It's really easy for me to start to innovate and think about how to improve products. And at Browning, they've tasked me with improving upon what they already have. So over the last six years, um, specifically focusing on the Upland line, we've been able to take some of the traditional cotton products that they have a lot of and sell a lot of, and roll into some really highly technical fabrics, some lighter weight, stronger fabrics, and, and in my opinion, make the hunting experience a lot of better. Well, you know, as a you know, as a diehard chucker hunter, if you can lighten my load by a half pound, I'm all for it. <laughs> I can do it. Yeah. I, I can definitely do that. Just tell me where the where the weight is right now, and we'll fix it immediately. Well, it's right around my waist. Can you do anything with that? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm in the wrong department. For that, yeah. Good if only if only it was that easy, man. Yeah, put put a, put a different fabric on. I'm I'm okay with it. You know, no, you're just you're talking about your water, right? <laughs> I had a one of the uh, one of my um, one of my FedEx drivers said, uh, "Yeah, I'm going to do this um, backpack with my nephew." And I used to be an ultralight backpacker, and now I've gained a little weight. And so I'm trying to, like, cut off half my toothbrush and, you know, wear light roots and all that. And I said something like, well, you know, you want to you want to you want to cut 25 pounds off of your hike? And he said, yeah. I said, you're looking at it. And I pointed at his waist. <laughs> <laughs> And, Good point. and it takes one to know one. I'm not. I'm not being a butthead. Yeah. I'm not honest. Well, so, well, so tell me. Uh, you know, you're out there. You're walking around. We're all doing it. The only people worse than us are fly fishers. But we're all walking yep. around thinking, you know, why don't they do this? Or they should do that. I mean, is that how it happens to you? Um. Yes. I get a lot of input from industry hunters, yeah. from personalities that are out all the time testing our products and using them. Our pro staffers get out and test. But I also spend a lot of time just talking with people that I find out hunting and trying to understand their problems and relating to them because a lot of the time I'm experiencing the same thing. Mm -hmm. I'm a an active guy. I like to get out and move. So lightweight is always a big question, like how can you make this better? I mean, trying to carry all of your, all of the products that you need from waterproof to insulated, depending upon the weather. I mean, breathability is a really big one, especially early in those September morning dove hunts, as well as, I mean, almost like bomb proof overlays on product to prevent the thorns, the cat claw, the briars from breaking through your pants. Those are some really big concerns that I think if you look across the upland landscape, people are always trying to innovate and resolve those. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and for me, that, that's definitely a challenge I'm continuing to face. Well, are there any, uh, you know, I'll never forget when rip stop nylon was a new thing. And yeah. we're, we're oh, so yeah. far beyond all that now. But what are the newest, <laughs> coolest, high techest fabrics that, that you guys are working with? Ooh, good question. Um, 
we have put some time into working with Kevlar. Yeah. Kevlar overlays are important. Um, we use a lot of heavy denier fabrics with coatings on them as well, trying to create breathable membranes or breathable coatings on the back of our heavy denier products. So when you're hiking through brush and it's getting really hot and you're sweating on your knees or on the back of your knees, we want that um, moisture transfer rate to be as high as we can so that you can stay as comfortable as you can. I think there's a lot of brands out there. I mean, Gore-Tex has done a really good job. Torre is creating some really unique fabrics and we've tried to implement some of that stuff into our product. Well, thanks number one for pronouncing denier <laughs> yeah. that way, because I don't think anybody ever says that word. They just look at it in, <laughs> in a catalog. Um, uh, and, and it is, you know, that it just for, for giggles, yeah. that is a measurement or a, some sort of a rating, isn't it? For what? It's for the thread size. So a heavier denier fabric, a heavier thread fabric, you can often, when you run your fingers across a fabric and you feel the texture of that fabric, it's generally a higher denier. Um, and you'll, you'll feel a different texture depending upon the thread count within that denier. Sure. So your, your really aggressive fabrics that you see on some of these overlays are just high denier fabrics. Kevlar is really similar. Um, you can feel uh, heavy fibers going through those fabrics. Okay, and so a higher denier is a more abrasion-resistant fabric? Is that what that really translates to? Yes. Okay. Ac absolutely. It's a, a heavier denier is a lot like that nylon ripstop you mentioned earlier. You've yeah, got a really yeah. thick fiber running through those. Okay. Okay. Good. Well, thank you. That's uh, thanks for taking me to school on that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so now the question is, what are you doing with it these days? Why don't you outline the, the upland side of your business, the, the, the kinds of products you have today? Okay. So Browning has a traditional portion of their line where it's a heavier cotton jacket, shap, strap vest, and denim style pant. Yeah. That is our, our staple, our base to our products. And we've had it in the line for many, many years through several product managers, and it's always sold really well, and it works really well. It's like if you have somebody that's just getting into to upland hunting and they just want a jacket that will keep them warm, keep the, the sticks and thorns off them, that heavier cotton is really good. As you start to get into more of a technical landscape or become a more experienced technical hunter, you start to notice problems yeah. with some yeah. of that heritage product, and you start looking more towards soft shells. You look at your base layer to keep moisture management taken care of so that you're not sweating as much when you're out hiking or when you're walking. You focus a little bit more on the type of insulation you're using. So here at Browning, in our – we. We've got some new products that we're rolling out coming this September, and one of them is um, a, a soft shell jacket that we have partitioned down the middle. So the upper portion of the jacket is three layers, meaning it's fleece on the inside. It's got a membrane that'll keep, it'll essentially make the fabric itself waterproof. Sure. And then we've got a, a tightly woven stretch face fabric that'll break off, uh, that'll basically protect you yeah and so the upper portion is three layer 100 percent windproof highly water resistant it's not seam tape so it's not waterproof mm -hmm. but the fabric is very highly water resistant and then the lower portion of that jacket is a two-layer fabric meaning it's the fleece as well as that tightly woven stretch fabric so it's lighter weight it's more breathable around your core and under your arms and it's got six pockets built into this jacket as well as a bird bag on the back Jeez. and underarm ventilation. Thank so you. Got, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's got everything built into this jacket that we here at Browning feel like a bird hunter wants, especially yeah. someone who's mobile and, and especially in, in some of those Western style hunts, this will be an ideal piece as your outer layer. Yeah. Um, just short of downpour weather. Got it. Um, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden. That's Russ Jones with Browning's Apparel Division. Um, you know, you, you back to that. What, what what did you call it? I think you call it legacy or heritage fabrics. 
I, re- I remember a, a company came to me once and said, well, here's our hunting vest and we want you to improve it. And so I did a lot of work and I finally realized, you know, it's perfect the way it is because there are certain people who want that legacy heavy duty canvas fabric. We did some other things to make it more technical, but, but there is that market there. Um, but who's using the new technical stuff? Is it guys like me who spend most of their hunts chasing chuckers? That's, that's a hard question to answer because it depends on what they have access to. I sure. Feel like. Of course. And, yeah. and what, what they understand, what their education level is on the type of fabric. If you have a really educated hunter that's looking for windproof, Mm -hmm. moisture management, they're looking for a pant that'll take care of a certain kind of briar, like heavier thorns that you might find down in Texas. You're going to see those hunters going after a more technical product. And as people enter the market, we see a lot of that going into Cabela's, going into Sportsman's Warehouse, shields academy and picking an upland blaze piece off the shelf knowing they're only going to hunt once a year so i would almost partition down the guy that's in the field 10 to 50 days a year and then the guy that's under three days a year between the heritage and the technical line and i think you'll you'll find that yeah with other brands make makes sense it really does it's all about uh, the value proposition in that case um absolutely Tell me a little bit more about, uh, about uh, of course, I, near and dear to my heart is that burden light vest. There's some engineering in there that nobody else uses. Can you walk us right. through that? Yes. The burden light vest has an, a built-in um, load-bearing system in it, similar to what you might find in a, a backpacking backpack. Mm-hmm. So the burden light vest is built out. On the face, it might look similar to other vests in the market, but it's not. It's got an internal belt that you you clip around your upper waist, right across your belly button, to hope for load bearing. And then it's got backpack-style straps coming across your shoulder straps that you can cinch down tight. So this inner portion of the vest is meant to be close to your body to hold all the weight. And then there's a secondary vest around the outside that allows you to easily access two front dump pockets to hold all your shells and any other accessories. It's got a really, it's got a large um, three to four pheasant bird bag in the back, as well as a hydration pack on the back side of that bird bag. And the technology behind it is really focused towards that hunter that's going longer distances and carrying more weight. Yeah. And that's why the bird and light strap vest is in my opinion, one of, one of the best, load-bearing upland vests in the market, if not the best. Well, I, I, I can't argue much with that. I helped redesign those pockets, by the way. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it, it's brilliant. Number one, it took me years to realize what bird and light meant. Yep. <laughs> it's a burden. Oh, yeah. But it's lighter. <laughs> Duh. Um, Play on words. Yeah, yeah. So, um yeah, wonderful product, and love what lo- what love what you're doing with it. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, what else you got coming up uh, in September? Well, September. There's two other pieces I really want to highlight. I guess this is my my personal push is helping upland hunters understand the importance of layering. And so at Browning, we've really focused our system on making the hunter more comfortable. So we already currently have a merino wool in the line and that thinner merino wool is designed for your October through your February hunt to keep you warm, to keep the moisture off your skin. Now the two, two styles I want to highlight for September that are coming out, we have an, a really unique fabric on an, on a button down shirt. The button down shirt is made out of this Browning air grid fabric and it's highly breathable, highly stretchy, so that your traditional flannel style jack or flannel shirt that a upland hunter might wear, this gives that same sort of feel, but is a lot more breathable and is a lot more applicable in your mobile hunting scenarios. As well as that high stretch shirt, we've got a, uh, a lens cleaner built into the bottom 
or a microfiber lens cleaner built into the hem of that shirt. So that you can clean your glasses, clean your gun if it's getting all covered in junk, but we kind of wanted to add a little bit of a, a fun flair to the bottom. Of the that is of clever. I love that. <laughs> I, I know a couple. Especially for those with glasses. You no, know, I know a couple of camera operators that are going to wear those shirts on, on some TV shoots oh. of mine. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I I've, been wearing, I've been wearing one to test, and it's, it's an unbelievable shirt. Just for all scenarios, really, um, I wear it to work too and love it. Oh, I bet you do. Uh, okay, uh, now uh, give me a tutorial on merino wool. I'm I'm wearing merino wool socks today, okay. and to me, it's a miracle fiber, and to a lot of other people as well. But but why is that? Well, wool's been around forever, right? Wool wool kind of has. You either love it or hate it. It's an itchy fabric in the traditional sense of wool. Well, in the last several years, there's been this merino wool, which is a finer wool. It's a certain breed of merino sheep that doesn't create the same um, epidural effect or the effect on your skin that a regular wool would. So it doesn't fit in that same category. So we can't mistake it with regular wool. Mm -hmm. It's meant to be worn next to skin and interacts directly with your skin. Mm -hmm. Merino wool itself is like a, a scaly fiber. And so when you start to sweat or your body starts to react to your m micro environment, the environment between your skin and your body, it pulls moisture directly off your body and that moisture is pushed to the outside of the fiber where it dries as quickly as possible. So you don't, it's, you don't feel that same kind of sticky feel that you get with a polyester and nylon base layer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's why in, sorry, go ahead. Well, it's, you know, the term we use is wicking, but it wicks yep. better than all those other wicking fabrics. It sounds like. It does. And it actually, Merino wool is not a heavy fabric, No, but it will, literally pull 30% of its own weight in moisture off your skin, which is quite a bit if the garment is six to seven ounces or something like that. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I, I think that Merino wool itself um, is the future of a lot of shirts and base layers as people start to understand how the technology makes you more comfortable. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I've, I've made a big push to kind of educate the people around me on the importance of using that kind of base layer. Well, you're talking around what, what, what I really would like to dig a little deeper into, and that is um, we often don't appreciate and so thus misuse many products that you guys like you have put a lot of time and effort into developing. And the first one is the strap vest, and you you talked about the waist belt. And I, I'm usually downhill and behind one of my best buddies on a chucker hunt and i'm looking at where he's wearing his waist belt and it ain't on his waist so so yeah. d take me to school on how to wear a strap vest the right way okay um that's a really good question because people's bodies are so different but here's here's the simple way i'd put it you've got the waist where you wear your pants and you've got your natural waist yeah so your natural waist is right above your hips, right in line with your belly button. That's where the majority of your weight should be held, whether you're wearing a strap vest or a backpack. That belt should literally cut right across or right below your belly button and sit on top of your hips. Mm -hmm. That way that all of the weight is pushing down on, or I guess it's aligning your back while you're loading that weight and you're not bent over, you're not putting weight in in, in areas like right over the top of your, your thighs or your mm -hmm. legs, it's, mm -hmm. it's definitely up on that hip location. Yeah. And so that's yeah. where yeah. I would suggest wearing all your, your belt. When that, when that radical concept was first espoused in backpacks about a million years ago by the Kelty company, <laughs> I, th I thought they were crazy till I used one. Um, yeah. So your hips so, basically become a little shelf. Correct. And it's kind of amazing how many people don't, seem to use that because I, I see the same thing when I'm hunting or hiking with people they they always wear their belts low generally people wear them low and, and then they complain about back pain or how uncomfortable it is or they can't load in a couple extra birds and 
And I think to myself, well, we'll put them in mine because I'm wearing mine the right way. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's so true. How about uh, oh, yeah. uh, how about the you know this whole idea of layering? Uh, I just wrote a little piece for somebody I don't even remember who, uh, and 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 mentioned that whole idea of having several layers. But you know, again, give us the company line on why layering is so critical. Layering's important from a comfort standpoint. So traditionally, hunters will throw on a heavy insulated, waterproof, non-breathable jacket that they just wear for every hunt. They go and do everything in it. And that works, but as we become a more educated society and educated hunter, we start to realize that there's better ways to do it. So if you can find a way to get a clothing item to work with your body and not against it, you will be able to focus more on the activity at hand and not sit and think, oh man, I'm, I'm sweating like crazy today. I'm overheating. I'm, I'm drinking all my water because I'm too hot and I, I wore too many, I wore too much insulation or, or whatever your situation may be. The idea behind layering is so that you can stay outside and hunt longer. You can have a better experience because you're able to focus on the animal you're hunting and not trying to make yourself comfortable. And that's why a lot of brands, especially Browning, has focused on the importance of their layers. Generally, if you look back to all your hunts, I would bet on your, your top especially, you'll wear a next-to-skin layer and then maybe a second layer depending upon the weather. And that third layer is only used in extreme situations. So those first and two, first and second layers are the most important ever. And so you should put the most time and energy in educating yourself on what's best for your style of hunting. There you have it. Russ Jones knows of what he speaks. He's with the apparel division at Browning. Some exciting news things coming out there. I love that that shirt idea. I'll be first in line for it when it comes out. Um, all sorts of other great stuff coming out there. How do we learn more about what you have now? You can learn about any Browning product by going to browning.com, and we have everything available to purchase on the website right now, as well as um, several of our pro staffers that you can find out in the marketplace. There you have it. Thanks so much, Russ. I'm going to say have a good weekend because that's when we're talking today. I appreciate your being a part of the Upland Nation podcast. Have a great day. Thanks, Scott. It was really good to talk to you. And we've got a lot more to come, so stick around. Heath Siner from Hunt Ready will be joining me in the second half of the program. Our Handle It segment talks about how a dog thinks. I think, and uh, lots more. So um, stick around for the rest of the Upland Nation podcast brought to you by PointerShotguns.com. You know, I was talking with the folks over there. By the way, another shipment of uh, shotguns has just come in, so it'll get processed and then be out to your favorite retailers very soon. So check in regularly and find out whether they've got new stock and that new stock could come in any number of colors i mean it's a rainbow out there now at pointer shotguns the new case coloring yes nickel receivers blued receivers and then don't forget everything can be cerakoted as well so you got a couple three choices in that as well so so a rainbow of color choices on your pointer shotguns learn more about the models you might want to look at including the new side by sides at pointershotguns.com and just off the phone with my friends at Midway USA don't you you know Larry Potterfield that guy is doing more for the second amendment and for youth shooting sports than uh, everybody else put together Larry and Brenda are doing a great job there, and they're um, now supporting the Upland Nation podcast. In fact, if you want to watch some exclusive videos on dog training that I'm putting together on a regular basis, go to Midway USA and then scroll down to the ambassador page. There's articles, there's videos, uh, not just from me, but from a whole bunch of other folks as well. So uh, learn something and then spend some money. And everybody needs to spend some money on a decent set of gunsmithing screwdrivers. Just ordered a new set for myself. Yeah, don't use your, you know, car, truck, home repair screwdrivers on your gun. They're not going to fit right. 
get some good screwdrivers or a set like I ordered at MidwayUSA.com. So we go from one uh, legacy company in the apparel world, among other things, to uh, one of the upstarts uh, who uh, is near and dear to my heart. They supported our uh, Fur Feathers Friends event. Heath Siner joins me from Hunt Ready. Heath, welcome to the program. Thank you, Scott. Really appreciate the opportunity. I got a little bit of a scratchy throat, so I apologize in advance. Ah, that should help. Jack Daniels. <laughs> no, not really. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Other podcast hosts would, but I wouldn't. Um, Heath, we got to start with the good stuff. Uh, how are your dogs? Uh, very good. Very good. I have a, um, I have a, uh, the, the elder of the crew is a Brittany, uh, who's 11 and has not, his days in the field maybe aren't quite as long, but he's still got that go in the heart so uh he still gets the nod out of the gate you know he's earned that spot and then i have a uh a drop uh who's four and a half um solid dog this year uh really you know came into his own um and then i have a uh a vishla that is technically my daughter's but she lets me hunt with it so <laughs> he, <laughs> he's the go-to when the temps are warm and when we're out um, you know, hunting the plains and, uh, sweet little dog. Um, but, but boy, he, uh, he handles his birds well on the plains. I and love, so, I love it. yeah, that's, that's where they're at. A mixed bag of dogs and uh, boy, tell your daughter, I told you this just to embarrass her. Make sure you tell her in front of friends, tell her, I remember when she was this tall, She'll hate me forever. Well, well dear. <laughs> well, dear. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I remember meeting her, what, a couple pheasant fests ago or something like that. Yes. She's yeah. been with me from the beginning. Yeah, that's great. And the beginning uh, being, number one, uh, hunting, and number two, uh, hunt ready. Um, but before we get yeah. to before we get to the company, I, I got to know, you were out in Montana last year, at least for a while. How was that hunt? We had a, we had a great trip out there, um, and, and as you know, you know you've 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 stumbled across those plains. There's nothing quite like it, uh, you know. And and bird numbers were good, uh, good friends, good company, and you know, honestly speaking, what else can you ask for? Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. when, you, yeah. when you head out to to, to chase birds, um, but yeah, I I enjoy the West, um, you know, Montana, Wyoming. Um, you know, and even, even a little bit further into Chucker country and that, um, it's, I live in the Midwest in Missouri. And so, you know, grew up with quail and pheasant and, um, you know, waterfowl, but you know, there's just nothing quite like chasing birds out there. So really enjoyed it. Okay. Being a Missourian, um, give us the lowdown. You know, we, we hear all this talk about, Oh, your great little tax setup and how it benefits wildlife, and some of that wildlife is actually Bob White's. Um, how's your quail population doing these days? Yeah, it, it really depends on where you're at in the mm -hmm. state, mm -hmm. and uh, you know if you're up uh, the northern part of the state, um, very very good, or it can be very good. Um, you know the 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 struggle I think that we have in Missouri is the amount of public access mm. whether that be um you know actual uh, game and fish type lands you know or government land we just don't have a solid program with uh, public landowners or, or excuse me private landowners uh, yeah, to gain yeah. public access a walk-in that's the struggle yeah. right yep in my opinion that's the that's really the downside um you know now there you know, there, there's there's opportunities to hunt and there's there's birds, but it's just not quite like a state that has a lot of really focused walk in in hunting. To be honest, you know, and I got to tell you, that's interesting. Uh, I just finished a, an e booklet on the topic of public land and walk in hunting, and and I I, I hadn't realized how little there is of that in 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 a state like Missouri, which prides itself on 
if check me on this, is it a like a, a quarter of a percent of a sales tax goes to wildlife conservation or something like that? Is that how it works? I, it is. I I would hate to I would hate to state the numbers yeah. without looking first. But yes, there is a there is a program like that, and and I would say you know um, as with anything, right? Uh, you know, in these types of programs, they have you know i think there's there's been a lot of investment in in our lakes mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in in fishing in access in those areas um you know and and i think whitetail you know the whitetail being sure. a yeah. you know a big commodity in missouri um and they have reintroduced elk in mark twain national forest which has done well so you know unfortunately um you know sometimes the bob whites maybe have taken a back seat. Sure. Um, yeah. Now, and they have done some programs on those fronts, but, um, you know, opportunity to improve, uh, sure. You know, uh, but I think in general, um, there are some programs that have been successful too. So sure. I'm going to give them some credit. Okay. <laughs> and speaking of credit, you, you guys are right up there on the leading edge uh, in, uh, in the Upland world uh, in terms of, innovation with a, 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 a line of products, I'll call it. Um, but let's start with the name, Hunt Ready, R-E-D-I. Who came up with that and what does it stand for? Yeah, yeah. so so we, you know, we, we thought about a lot of different angles and a lot of different, um, you know, strategies on naming. And, and R-E-D-I stands for Reliable Equipment Driving Inspiration in the outdoors was, is really kind of where that came from. And, um, you know, we, we are, are certainly passionate upland hunters and, and I'm sure we'll get to, you know, how this all kind of came about momentarily, but, um, you know, we also do things like waterfowl Mm -hmm. and big game. And, you know, if there's opportunities in those areas, well, um, you know, we certainly didn't want to limit ourselves to just upland. But yeah, yeah. That certainly being being a primary passion, hunt ready is is kind of what we settled on on for those reasons. And and it is <clears throat> our our previous guest uh, talked around the very subject of how your gear can really decide whether you've had a good day in the field or not. You agree? Certainly. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. And, you know, just, um, <clears throat> you know, and, and, and I'll, I'll go back a ways here, Scott, you know, uh, probably been six, eight years ago, mm-hmm. uh, at least that now, uh, we were hunting Bob whites in Missouri, uh, I was hunting with my cousin and a couple of buddies and, and, um, my cousin crossed the Bob wire fence and, and ripped the shell pouch wide open and all the shells go out, you know, on the ground is, is probably most of us have had something similar right over the years. <laughs> and, and at that moment I stood there and thought, huh, cause he made the comment, gosh, you know, now I got to have this thing sewn up or I got to go buy a new vest or whatever. And I thought, huh, I wonder if we could come up with a vest that had interchangeable pockets and pouches. And, and it, that really is kind of where the hunt ready idea and concept started right there in the field, chasing Bob whites in Missouri. And so that was what opened the door to start thinking about it. And because if you, if you've been in the uplands for very long as you have, um, you know, the, the uplands have not really, (laughs) I would say at the time, you know, and I, as I mentioned earlier, like we waterfowl hunt, we big game hunt in the off seasons, we'll rock climb and camp. And, and there was so much innovation you know, and so many new products and gear in, in those different verticals. And we were always talking about, man, we need to, you know, someone needs to come up with, you know, fill in the blank. Right. And, yeah. And then it was like, well, maybe that's an idea. Maybe it's us, honestly. You know, and, (laughs) and so we started, we started exploring it and, and, uh, so that's, that's really how it all kind of, kind of kicked off and started. You know, I love that idea, <clears throat> and yeah, we all have been there, and uh, um, I'm looking at my hunt-ready vest now. What do I have? A Elevate? Is that what it's called? Elevate, I think. 
anyway, it, it's it's clever in so many ways. And I want you to let's start with uh, with a, the grand tour. Take me on the fifty cent tour of of one of your vests. So what are some of the features and benefits? Yeah, and so so going back to the the to, to the the story there, right? The the first thing was, can we make a a product that that could be configurable, right? Mm. That could be customizable to you and your interests and needs and likes. And and we started talking with different people that we hunt with, other passionate uplanders, and said, hey, if you were gonna if you were gonna make a vest, you know, or or or, or what vest do you like, or what what features of certain vests do you like and scott you'll never get the same answer yeah <laughs> you know uh someone wants velcro someone doesn't like velcro somebody wants buttons somebody wants snaps somebody doesn't like buttons somebody you know and so it just kind of really fed the yeah i think we are on to something here yeah, you know yeah. um and so so we started with 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 a belt with the, the the belt because that really is the in in our opinion that's the foundation you want you want that belt to be able to support the weight to take the load put it on your torso right and with the with a with a, a lower lumbar pad and then a, 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 a nice padded and supported belt and and from there uh, we added. Um, it's it's a it's a patented system made by First Spear uh, called 612, and that is essentially the laser cut panels that you see on the belt and on the on parts of the vest, and and that that system is essentially what allows you to um, you know pull pockets off, take you know put pouches on and and change things around, and so we started there, and then game pouch wise, you know our goal was to essentially create a product where everything could be operated by one hand. Yeah. Well, what do you have in the what what do you have in the other hand, right? Your you, gun. You, I mean, no, usually it's a dog collar. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Or or or, or a e collar to try yeah, you know, uh, uh try and figure out where your dog is, right? Yeah. But, um, but but uh so that was really the what we what we focused on and tried yeah. to achieve was a, 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 a very lightweight platform and, and our, our vest fully kitted out come in about three point three to three and a half pounds. No kidding. Before you start adding shells and water and, you know, all the things that we carry, yeah, right? Yeah. Um and then um we wanted it very customizable. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we we took that technology and ran with it and we essentially sit down with their designers and we came up with, you know, the, I mean, it was, it was completely our design. We worked with them and, you know, I mean, they, they certainly helped us along the way cause we didn't know anything about cut and sew manufacturing or anything right, like that. Yeah. It was completely yeah. out of our element. And then from there we, um, we wanted durability. And so, um, you know, that's the other advantage that we have working with first spear is they, their 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 sole business is manufacturing gear for the military and law enforcement agencies around the world, and so um, we felt like, well, if 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 their if their material, their sewing and manufacturing processes can hold up to that, then they should be able to hold up to what we're going to put it through in the uplands. I love so it. So those were the three kind of main things that we focused on. So uh, made in the USA. Um... It is. Designed. It's actually sourced and made yeah. uh, in the USA. So everything down to the zippers, the thread, wow, it is all 100% uh, U.S. sourced, and then it's hand-sewn in St. Louis, actually, the right outside of St. Louis in Fenton, Missouri. Oh, great. So you can just buzz up there anytime you want to gripe about something. <laughs> yeah. <they've laughs> been, they have been tremendous to work with. I bet. Um, you know, a lot of the people that work there are former law enforcement or military mm-hmm. uh, or come from that type of a background. And, and those folks typically, uh, you know, share the same types of passions we do in the outdoors, you yeah. know? Um, yeah. Yeah. And so it's been a good, it's been a good partnership for sure. Well, I, I, you know, you, you, you do this, you work, it's a labor of love for a long time and then it comes out onto the market. Uh, what has been the reaction? You've been in, you know, you've been 
you've been in business for a lot longer than you've actually had product on the market. But even that's been at least oh, what, a couple of years. <laughs> um, well, how, yeah, we what were... do people think about that? Yeah, so, so you know, that was looking back, Scott, like we had, you know, there really wasn't uh, anything like this in terms of, of what I would call a, a, a highly customizable, mm-hmm. uh, you know, platform that, and so we, honestly speaking, we weren't even sure if people would get it, you know, when we, <laughs> when, when we launched at Pheasant Fest a number of years ago, um, and that's been, I guess, four or so now, um, we just weren't sure, you know, are they going to get it? Is it, is, is, are the uplands ready, you know, for something like this? Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, we had, we had, had spent a couple of seasons just field testing it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And to the point you made at the very beginning, right. Is comfort in the field, you know, allowing you to further enable, you know, your pursuits, you know, it's super lightweight. It's customizable to how you want it. I shoot lefty. So have, you know, having the ability to put, you know, my primary shell pouch style that I want on my left side Mm -hmm. versus my right, which the vast majority are righties. Right. And I get it. Um, but things like that, it was like, yeah, I think we are onto something. And we had buddies, you know, we asked various other friends of ours, you know, that, Hey, try this out. Let us know what you think. Give us feedback. we made tweaks based on that. Right. And, and, and most of them said, Hey, when you come out with one, hold one back for me. And we're like, okay. <laughs> yeah. We're on to something. I love it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and those prototypes are coming back to haunt you every day. I'm sure <laughs> I'm looking at yours right now. And, and this is not a prototype. This is a production model and it, it served me well. In fact, can you hear that? Those are empties from last season still in the back. <laughs> uh, so, Very nice. So I'm, I'm putting it on. So I'm putting it on. It's it's basically a strap vest. Everybody knows what they look like. It's got a nice, yep. substantial hip belt, and um, and the the thing that I I'm I'm a, pardon me, but I'm I'm really a fanatic about stuff like this. I wear it high on the hips, and I cinch that yep. belt really tight because it's got to yeah, carry that- roughly a gallon and a half of water. And that's the real key right. with me. And, and the only way to make that work is to, is to really keep it up on your hips. But beyond that, okay, I've got yep. a, a breast strap, a breast. What do we call that belt thing? That a stern, so you, sternum. So you got a strap. sternum strap. Thank you. Yeah. That 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 you can move up or down. Yeah. You know, on your uh, on your yoke. So that um, the the. Uh, yeah, the um, the 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 where the yoke comes down mm-hmm. uh, off your shoulders and basically will attach to you know your belt. That's that's movable as well, so yeah. you can you can move that to more of a suspender style attachment point or all the way back and actually attach it to the game bag and create more of a what we call kind of a backpack style. So there's a lot of adjustment even in the yoke itself, right? Uh, yeah. Where it connects and what's more comfortable to you. We have some that, you know, they're very much aware of and, and mindful of gun placement, totally get that, and they prefer an attachment point that's a little, you know, more up front, right, to get those more suspender style and out of the way. And then mm-hmm. others, if they're chucker hunting or, you know, uh, away from the truck all day, that backpack style um, provides a bit more stability, yeah. you know, like a yeah. big game pack or something like that. And so there's just, you know, again – we wanted it to be very customizable to meet your needs uh, in the field. There's attachment in the, the top of the game bag for hydration bladder. Um, you know, and then we of course have the water bottle holders and all of that. And so a lot of customized, you know, customization uh, capabilities built into it out of the box. Yeah. I like the ability to be, be able to, be able to hang stuff. I don't like a lot of stuff hanging and rattling around, but you, you can also hide it inside the game bag. There's a big pouch there. And on the back right. of the game bag, there's a small pouch inside a big pouch. So you can put a lunch, a jacket, yeah. all those sort of things. You can also attach a lot of that stuff via straps on the back. Um, mm-hmm. 
the the other things that I, I'm recalling are you, you can choose the kind of pockets you want. You mentioned some of the attaching yep. versions of that. The, all those things make for basically a custom-built vest. Uh, it doesn't come yes. cheap, but it's one of those. No, in, no but sir. It's an investment that uh, most people would probably spend at least that much on cheap vests. Yeah, and that and that's you know that's been the you know when you when you said that about you know how did the market react and what's been the reception and all of that um, you know I think I would say that we've been extremely humble mm -hmm. that would be probably the words I would use mm -hmm. uh, we've had a tremendous amount of support in the community and and certainly we've had you know a number of people say well geez you know I why, why why didn't you guys make a you know 150 dollar you know vest like i you know well there's a lot of those on the market already like that's not what we were trying to achieve you know yeah i mean and that was really it like we're we were trying to achieve a highly durable vest that that would last and would give the flexibility you know to be able to customize it and so and it certainly does come at a at a at a cost um but the other thing that we are committed to is is U.S. sourced and made, and, mm -hmm. and that is an investment. That's an investment we made, and and the people that appreciate that and respect that, I think they they understand that, and um, you know, when they get their hands on it and touch it and feel it and see the quality, it's it, it's there. You know, in my opinion. So, what is what? Just for the record, what is the fabric that most of this vest is made out of? Yeah, so it's a um, the 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 foundational fabric is a is a Kedora, uh fabric, and and it's either five hundred or a thousand based on you know the specific pieces sure. on the vest. So, mm -hmm. uh, and then the the laser cut panels mm -hmm. are a uh, are a patented. They're essentially a five hundred Kedora, and then there's a there's a um, there's a material that's bonded to them on the back that provides the attachment. Um, uh, loop part of like the like a commercial grade velcro okay. uh, loop material oh yeah and and that fabric is is uh, patented and 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 first beer actually did not disclose the details of all of that but um it the laser cuts uh they have a big laser laser machine and it it's all catted out and you know done via, via computer but um those um those laser cuts are extremely strong because of that bonding agent and bonding material that they do. And, um, so it, it provides an exceptional strength, but also significantly lighter weight than like a traditional Molly system, which is often used in these types of applications and, and has been used obviously in the military for a long time. But, um, so, you know, there, there's a couple of benefits there just in strength and weight savings. Yeah, you know, you mentioned it. I just stuck my finger in there. It is a two-layer fabric, and uh, don't mm -hmm. <clears throat> you don't know? Thank goodness, because if you told me, you'd probably have to kill me. So um, <laughs> it, it is clever and it is flexible. And um, speaking of clever and flexible, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm the clever one, Scott Linden. He's the flexible one. He's signer with Hunt Ready. Um, Heath, if, if people want to learn more about your products, what's the website address over there? Yeah, it's uh, www.huntready.com, and that's H-U-N-T-R-E-D-I.com. You got anything new on the horizon we should know about? We are we are looking at some, some uh, additional uh, products, uh, some to complement what we already have, and then some new ones as well. Um, doing some testing at the moment, but yeah, be on the lookout for this coming upland season. Uh, we should have a few things in the bag and then, uh, have been talking to a couple of partners, uh, potential partners about some, some products that I'm excited, excited about working with them on as well. So, uh, yeah, keep an eye out. We're, we're, uh, we're always thinking and, 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 and getting a lot of good feedback, right. From, from yeah. our customers, oh, which yeah. is, which is extremely valuable, you know, for us. So, well, good. You and, never know. And I alluded to Montana. Um, can we watch your film there? Yeah, yeah. It's it's on the website, and then it's also on our YouTube channel. Great. So you know, uh, uh, hit on the website or just a quick search for Hunt Ready YouTube, and yeah, there's a, a multiple state uh, tour that we did, and 
which includes North Dakota, Montana, and Wyoming with some good friends of ours and had a great time chasing birds out west. So The trifecta of adventure. For sure. <clears throat> Groovy. Well, Heath Signer with Hunt Ready and HuntReady.com. You're going to learn more about them there. Uh, heck, this might be the longest conversation we've ever had. <laughs> now that I think about it. <laughs> Fair enough. I think so. Yeah. Thanks for your support on the Fur Feathers Friends thing. Uh, and uh, thanks for some clever ideas coming out of your shop there. And uh, hope to hear more about some of the new stuff as it becomes available. Thanks so much for being a part of the Upland nation podcast thank you scott talk soon coming up next the handle it segment where i want you to be more like a boy scout yeah if you don't know what i mean by that just stick around because your dog will be grateful that you did we're brought to you in part by mid valley clays and shooting school yeah now that the weather has simmered down maybe it's time to take a daycation or a vacation. Hook up the RV, park it at Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School, and uh, play a few of the new games out there. Yeah, everything from trap to skeet to five stand to sporting clays. Lots of fun out there. Get ready for a new one coming soon. And don't forget about After Hours Wednesday. So if you are working late, just call ahead. They'll keep the range open for you on Wednesday nights. Might even take a lesson or two while you're there. Go to midvalleyclays.com and schedule your next visit. They're in central western Oregon near the big town of Salem. And it's always worth a little bit of a detour. Midvalleyclays.com. Your dog would appreciate it if you would um, take a look at joydogfood.com. This company's been around for 75 years, family owned and operated. Everything they do is American-made with American ingredients. What a concept. Yeah, they know of what they speak. They've been serving the hound world for three-quarters of a century, and now they're making their product more available nationwide at the best feed store in your town. Check them out, Joy Dog Food. They've got several high-performance formulations, depending on what your dog needs and your budget can afford. Joy dogfood.com No, what's that what's that phrase once a boy scout always a boy scout yeah uh that's me i prefer to be prepared when i give a command to my dog now if he's also prepared things generally go better for both of us now most of the time preparation is simply a matter of eliminating distractions as you're training because the distractions can override. They can be more tempting than the command you're about to give. Yeah. Dogs do think in a linear manner. A goes to B, goes to C. It never goes A to D. So, literally and figuratively, minimize the number of distractions. For example, a very young dog, when I want that dog to come to me, I wait until there's nothing between him and me, and then I'll make the call, or I'll tug on the check cord if you still got one on. No trees, no shrubs, no people, no fence, no other dogs. All of those things will increase his chance of distraction. And once that bush is in the way, he's at risk of losing track of the original command, which is right to your front. Now, this holds true for all sorts of other commands as well. So think about it when you are training your dog and then also in the field when you are expecting your dog to follow those directions implicitly. Eliminate distractions. Try and make eye can contact because as um, our friends John and Jessica Han reminded us recently, where the eyes look, the feet follow. If he's literally focused on the end game, you're both going to succeed. Well, I want to thank both Heath Seiner and Russ Jones uh, for all of your insights, your expertise, and your experience. Sure enjoyed talking to both you. And uh, on behalf of everybody, thank you for your knowledge and your help. 
If you commented at the social platforms, I can't get to everybody on the show, but I'm doing my best. Thank you for all your input. Just keep up the good work. If you left a rating or a review at your podcast platform, thank you very much. That's how we grow. And thank you to all our sponsors, Sage and Breaker, Pointer Shotguns, Joy Dog Food, Mid-Valley Clays, and True Lock Jokes. You are the ones who make this all possible. Thank you very much. The only people I have left to thank are you, dear listeners. Sure appreciate your kind attention and hope you learned something I know I did. Until we meet again somewhere on the podcast, I'll see you at the range.